All right, technology seems to be working. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Keenan Crane, who came all the way uh, from Carnegie Mellon University in the US. <laughs> way over there, somewhere. Yeah. Um, ever since I met Keenan about, what, seven, eight years ago, I've uh, seen quite a few talks of his. And every single talk has been very interesting. So uh -oh. very much looking forward uh, to this talk at the crossroads of uh, well, computer graphics and actually interesting differential geometry. So Thank we're going to see something about differential geometry and develop developability. Great. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction. I'm glad you set expectations so high I can't possibly meet them, but I'll do my best. Uh, so good morning. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Thanks to uh, Helmut and the GCD for organizing this wonderful symposium. Um, and actually, the last talk was a pretty good setup for some of the things I'm going to talk about. Um, so looking at this question of developability, things like paper, but through the lens of differential geometry and, and, and still with an eye towards things like fabrication and design. And uh, looking at the program, I realized I missed one important word from the title, which is discrete. So in the, in the program, it just says differential geometry. But really, uh, what I do, what I'm interested in, is discrete differential geometry. So a very basic way of, of thinking about that is I want to take continuous objects, smooth objects, smooth surfaces, curvatures, whatever, and break them up into little pieces that are easy to compute with. And that's kind of the traditional point of view on discretization. Um, but what we discover over the years, as you look at more of these, these problems of discretization, is that actually all this knowledge you gain is very useful for going the other direction as well. So there are lots of phenomena in nature or in engineering or in design that start out and have a discrete kind of nature. And it actually turns out to be very useful to say, ah, well, I can use uh, sort of smooth models or smooth analogies to get a deeper insight into this problem, or even develop more efficient computational algorithms. And that really geometry itself is not living you know, over here on the smooth side or over here on the discrete side, but geometry is all those things that kind of stay the same no matter how you write down the problem. And that's what we're going to look at today for developable uh, materials, developable surfaces. So just to give some sense of how these things work, a uh, very classic example, you go out into nature and you find these beautiful soap bubbles and you might want to know, OK, how do I make those shapes? How do I approximate them? What do they look like? So very classic thing, break it up, break up a surface into a triangulation, uh, either cook up some notion of uh, mean curvature or do area minimization. This is kind of classical uh, numerical analysis. Uh, but it can happen in the other direction. You might also be looking through your microscope at a sheet of graphene. So this is a bunch of carbon atoms connected in a hexagonal lattice. and Certainly, you could analyze this at a discrete level, but you say, look, I have this huge sheet, many, many degrees of freedom. Maybe it's better to think about this as really a continuous surface, um, but using my knowledge about discrete curvatures and so forth to understand things about morphology or electronic structure and so forth. And people really do uh, approach it this way. Uh, a little closer to the things we're talking about in this uh, symposium, there are just lots of beautiful structures in architecture, for instance, these are uh, self-supporting structures, so uh, pure compression structures. And in recent years, people have gotten a lot of deep insight into uh, the design of these things, the behavior of these things, by coming up with discrete computational analogies, so working with things like power diagrams or discrete differential forms or various other ways of doing that. So this is, again, this idea of going from the continuous to the discrete. Um, but also, you can go the other way. So you might say, well, I want to make a building out of many panels, uh, and I need them to have constant thickness because maybe I'm making them out of glass. How do I explore the space of designs? Well, that sounds like a very discrete combinatorial thing. But actually, there's some very nice work saying, well, this is closely related to something in the smooth setting, which is uh, curvature line parameterizations of surfaces. So again, going back from the discrete to the continuous. And this is what I'm, the basic approach I'm going to take in talking about developable uh, materials. So first, asking this very classic question of what does it mean 
for a discrete surface to be developable. How do we translate that concept from smooth into this, the discrete? And then taking a look at a very interesting uh, type of material that is developable but created from lots of little individual components, so this discrete structure, and thinking about how we can model that and talk about that and, and develop computational design algorithms using smooth conformal mappings. Okay, so maybe the first thing I should do before going any further, I, I've already used this word so many times, uh, if you don't know what it means, so developable. Uh, well, the first thing you don't know, what, what you do when you don't know a word is you go grab a dictionary, you go to dictionary.com, and you look up, okay, what does developable mean? Well, uh, according to dictionary.com, developable means it's a, a surface that can be flattened into the plane without stretching or compressing any part of it as a circular cone. So clearly these guys are not mathematicians. Uh, this is not a very precise definition, but it gets some basic ideas right. So for instance, if I have a nice smoothly bending piece of paper, uh, that's certainly developable. I can flatten it out into the plane. Uh, if I have a paper cone, actually, I'm not, not really sure what they're thinking because it seems pretty hard to flatten this cone without stretching it or, or, or ripping it or something. So maybe what I have to do is cut off the tip of the cone and then cut along the length. Okay, but then I can flatten this out. So that's you know, reasonably uh, good representative of a developable surface. Uh, a really important picture to keep in mind, though, I think this is what people often think when they think about you know, developability, but also you know, this surface is also flattenable. Right? I can take this crumpled piece of paper and, and smooth that out in the plane. So according to dictionary.com, this is a developable surface. And it's something that we're going to have to come to terms with actually when we go to uh, talk about discretization. Uh, because when we, you know, what do we want to do with these developable surfaces? We want to make things maybe that look like this. We want to do developable design. So maybe we're working on the hull of a ship or we're working on uh, there was some discussion about Gary in the last talk, so maybe we're working on the Walt Disney Concert Hall or some other uh, art or architectural artifacts. Right, so here we have these nice smooth uh, pieces of, of flat material like plywood or sheet metal or paper. Uh, of course, that's not the only reason why developable surfaces are interesting. Uh, there are also contexts where you care about uh, dynamic or deployable structures. So if you've ever put a heat shield over your, your car windshield or sunscreen, or if you have an IKEA laundry basket that folds up to store nicely when you're not using it. Um, there are also some very interesting dynamical properties of developable surfaces. So this is a surface called the Oloid, and it's just kind of a fun example because it rolls along the surface, and every point on the surface touches uh, the ground as it rolls. Um, going even further far afield, even geologists care about developability. So there are lots of situations where you have sheets of earth that over time get bent, but not severely uh, sheared or, or stretched. So this is a, a common model that's used and good to have computational tools for developable surfaces even there. Uh, in terms of actually fabricating or manufacturing developable geometry, we're getting more and more sophisticated over the years. So uh, most basic way perhaps is you take a, a flat sheet of material and you you force it through some rollers, and that lets you make things like cones and generalized cylinders and so forth. Um, more recently, people have been doing some very, very sophisticated robotic path planning to manufacture developable surfaces with interesting uh, creases. Or actually, we have a demonstration back there of, a, of another nice way of uh, getting curved folds by pulling strings on sheets of metal. So very, again, complicated path planning. Actually. One thing that I, I think is not immediately obvious when you think about uh, the use of developable surfaces in manufacturing, you know, often people do gravitate towards these thin materials, but also for millings, the very traditional manufacturing, uh, you just want to take a solid block and cut out some material until you have the shape that you, that you desire. Uh, turns out that if you use a cylindrical milling head, uh, this, this is one way of improving the efficiency and the accuracy of your milling process. And so you can imagine I'm taking this cylindrical head and I'm sweeping out some surface in space. Now, for those of you who know a little bit of geometry, that sounds like ruled surfaces, but actually because this cylinder has a finite size, you kind of pay a price anytime there's twisting. So this is a process called flank milling, and you can say during flank milling of a non-developable ruled surface, the existence of a twist implies that it's impossible to machine the workpiece perfectly using a non-null diameter center, so something that's not infinitely thin. 
So there's good reason to prefer things that are developable or at least near developable when it comes to this kind of fabrication. And here's sort of a sneak preview of uh, the kind of geometry we've been producing. So this is a doubly curved mechanical part that results from some kind of uh, topological shape optimization. And we then run a, a developable flow that takes it to something that is piecewise developable and, and hopefully uh, more easily manufacturable. Okay, so this is coming out of work that I've been doing uh, with Eitan Grinspoon from Columbia University. And uh, the basic idea is that you know, rather than thinking about discrete algorithms, again, we're starting out in the smooth setting and saying, okay, what, from the perspective of differential geometry, is a process that would turn a surface into something that is more developable? Okay, so this more traditional perspective of going from continuous to discrete. And the motivation, again, comes from, you know, design and fabrication. If we look at a lot of these designs, they're very beautiful, very, very elegant forms, but they all have one thing in common, which is, that they all have very simple uh, geometry and also very abstract geometry. Right? Each of these pieces is very smooth, there's only a few pieces, and they don't really describe a very complicated shape. Um, so our motivation is to say, well, what if we wanted to take absolutely any surface, let's say described by an unstructured triangulation, and turn it into a collection of developable patches? What would be a principled way to do that? And so what we end up saying is, all right, well, we're going to take a variational uh, point of view. So we're going to find some simple geometric energy that pushes the surface towards a nearby developable surface, which also encourages ruling lines to sort of appear on the surface. And you can kind of see that in this example, this sphere turning into these patches that eventually have straight lines in them. Um, the other thing that you notice is all the curvature, of the, all the sort of uh, intrinsic curvature concentrates onto these curves. The nice thing about taking this geometric approach is the algorithm ends up being very simple in the end. So we can take any triangle mesh as input, we just do some iterative local computation at each vertex, no special tricks or sophisticated remeshing, this is really being driven by the geometry of the problem rather than lots of different algorithmic steps. And that's the kind of thing we're, we're interested in doing. So if my goal is to make triangle meshes developable, the first question I have to answer is what does it even mean for a triangle mesh to be developable? And we had definition, or we had some, at least dictionary definition in the smooth setting. And here we're going to be guided by a principle that is common uh, throughout discrete differential geometry, which is that whatever discretization we pick, it should respect important invariance of the object that we care about. In other words, there are very basic properties that we observe to be true about developable surfaces, and those should also be true when we carry over to the discrete setting. Okay, so what are those properties? Uh, well, Let's go a little more in depth than this dictionary.com uh, definition. So the first thing I'm going to do is just define what it means for the surface to be developable or flattenable. So at any smooth, for any smooth surface, at a point I have a normal, and I can pick any tangent direction. And then I can take a plane that slices the surface through that normal and that tangent, and I get a curve. And the curvature of that curve is called the normal curvature associated with that direction. So then I can ask, among all possible directions, what's the, what's, what are the extreme values of curvature? And those are called the principal curvatures, which I'll write as kappa 1 and kappa 2. And just by convention, I'll say kappa 1 is the principal curvature that's smaller in magnitude. Okay, so then how do you detect if a, sur if a sur surface can be flattened? Well, if one of those two principal curvatures is zero, that means there's some direction along which the surface isn't bending, right? And so I can flatten flatten out the surface in the other direction. Um, so one way to characterize that is to look at the Gaussian curvature, the product of the two principal curvatures, and say that a smooth surface is developable if its Gaussian curvature k is zero at every point. So again, that it can sort of locally be flattened. So here are just a couple examples. I have a little patch of a, of a cylinder, a little piece of a cone. Those are kind of classic uh, developable surfaces. Okay. Another really important fact, though, that we, we want to think about in our discretization is that at each point of a developable surface, we always have a straight ruling line. Right? And we kind of already know that because we said one of the principal curvatures is zero. So if we slice through the surface some plane in that direction, we know we're just going to get a straight line. Um, it's important at this point to also 
uh, remind ourselves that actually not all ruled surfaces are developable, so this only goes one way. For instance, here's a surface made of straight lines that has negative Gaussian curvature. Okay. So not in, it's not sufficient to be ruled, but it is definitely something we're interested in. Okay, so what about discrete definitions of developability? Well, the good news is people have already spent a lot of time thinking about this for quad meshes. So, very simple statement. Actually, an arrangement of n planar quads in a single row is a discrete representation of a developable surface. So what does it mean for a quad to be planar? It means if I have the four vertex positions, P1, P2, P3, P4, they're all in a plane. Um, and so, for instance, if I have a sequence of these planar quads, I get something that looks like this. It does really resemble strips of paper. And I get the two properties that I care about. So for one thing, it's certainly flattenable. I have these planar quads, and if I have two of them next to each other, I can easily fold them into the plane without stretching or shearing or tearing or anything like that. And also, there's a very clear notion of ruling lines, just the edges going from one side of the strip to the other. So we have in this discretization the two basic properties that we care about. Okay, but sort of the, the drawback or in the context of design, something we might not like about quad meshes is that um, for a whole surface, we don't always know where to put the quad mesh. We have to make some decision about that. So if instead we wanted to start just from any triangulation, we need a good definition of developability for triangle meshes. And if you ask somebody about this uh, who's a little familiar with this area, they say, oh, sure, no problem. Uh, Triangle mesh is discretely developable if the angle sum around each vertex is equal to 2 pi. Because after all, that's the angle sum around a vertex in the plane. Right? So if, if I have that, I can easily flatten it out. Flattenability is what developability is, so I'm done. And you could even say uh, I have now a discrete analog of Gaussian curvature, which measures how far I am from flat. So I measure 2 pi, the angle sum that I want, minus the angle sum that I have at a vertex. That's the discrete Gaussian curvature. All right, so this is traditional definition. A, triangula a triangulated surface is developable if the angle sum equals 2 pi at every vertex. And OK, so then you start looking, what are surfaces that satisfy that definition? Well, here's one, very nice one, tangent developable surface. Looks like it has nice ruling lines and certainly looks easy to flatten out in the plane. The place where it starts to hurt is when you look at surfaces like this. So this is also a surface where every single vertex has exactly 2 pi angle sum. So I can flatten this out just like I can flatten out a crumpled piece of paper. But this is not the kind of thing I want for developable design. So if I start plugging this into algorithms, you know, I'm going to pull on some handles and, and try to make a nice shape. If this is the, the notion I'm working with, I can get all sorts of garbage coming out of my algorithm. And this does, this does really happen. OK, so basically what happened here is we had these two invariants. We cared about flattenability. OK, sure. I can definitely flatten this thing. But where are the ruling lines? In general, I didn't get that second property that I was so interested in. Okay, And in fact, uh, if you dig a little deeper, even this idea that these surfaces can be flattened is a bit problematic. So here's a really nice example from uh, Morvan and Tiber who say, OK, take some surfaces that are inscribed in a nice smooth half cylinder. Uh, these are what are called the Schwartz lantern. And if you try flattening these out, what you find is that they have different areas depending on how many triangles you used. So really not capturing uh, the behavior of these you know, pieces of paper in the smooth setting, right? A, a real piece of paper has only one area when you flatten it. Okay, so come back to this question. What does it mean to be discreetly developable? Well, so far what we know is that zero angle defect seems to be a pretty bad definition. It doesn't, doesn't get us all the way there. Okay, so, and, and again, and what, how do we see this? Well, because it, it's giving us, you know, it's, it's correct in some sense. It's giving us all these developable surfaces, including these crumpled developable surfaces. But somehow, we want to enforce this idea that we really just want ruled developables. Okay, so let's go back to the drawing board. And what we're going to do is say that a vertex is a hinge if the triangle normals around the vertex can be partitioned into exactly two edge-connected regions over which the normals are constant. So a much shorter way of saying that is if the vertex looks like an open book, then we're going to call it a hinge. And by the way, that includes a book that's been opened all the way, so a completely flat vertex. Okay? And then we're just going to say, and we'll see, you know, see where this takes us, but we're going to say that a 
Triangle mesh is discretely developable if every vertex is a hinge. Very simple idea. So for instance, there's a triangle mesh where every vertex is a hinge. And one thing that you, you see very quickly, your eye very quickly says, ah, yeah, and it, it looks like this thing has uh, ruling lines. And you can argue this to yourself pretty easily. Okay, if, I, if I'm a vertex and I have, if I'm a hinge, I, go, I can find a neighboring vertex that's also along that hinge line and it'll have the same hinge and so forth. Okay, so as long as none of the vertices are planar, then these hinge meshes or these discretely developable meshes have ruling lines. Um, the other thing that's interesting is if we erase all the edges in this triangle mesh, the thing we get looks just like a planar quad strip. So basically our definition of developability for triangles agrees with what we said we wanted for quads, and that's a pretty nice property to have. Okay, so then the question becomes, okay, you have this definition, uh, how do you actually find surfaces that satisfy this definition? What's the computational part? And <clears throat> we're gonna take a pretty standard approach of doing optimization. So uh, for every surface, we can associate it with some kind of energy that says how much we like that surface, how close it is to satisfying the criteria that we care about. And then we ski downhill the gradient, right? And we'll get a sequence of different surfaces along the way. This is not, by the way, the energy we care about, right? <laughs> this is not very developable. If anything, it's less developable, but that's the, the conceptual idea. The problem we run into is that, okay, this, this sounds like kind of a nasty thing to optimize. We have this kind of combinatorial definition. A vertex is a hinge if its triangles can be partitioned into two edge connected regions, blah, 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 blah. Uh, that doesn't make for very nice energy. Uh, makes for, sounds like a pretty awful algorithm, actually. Uh, fortunately, we have this very nice theorem which says actually a vertex will look like a hinge if and only if, for one thing, it's embedded, so no self-intersections allowed, and two, if all of its normals are in a common plane. And for me, this is at least a little bit surprising that merely by asking for all the normals to be in the same plane, I'm actually forcing them to be just one of two directions. I kind of force the normals to bifurcate. So that's nice that it works out that way because what it lets us do is formulate a very simple uh, energy for measuring how developable or how discreetly developable the surface is. So what we're gonna do is sum up these values lambda. What are lambda? Well, lambda are the smallest eigenvalues of a matrix that's just the outer product of all the normals. I'm not going through the, the derivation there, but it's actually not so hard to see. And once we have this energy, we simply say, okay, take the gradient of this energy with respect to the vertex positions and that's our algorithm. That's the whole thing. So very, very simple, uh, but turns out to do some very interesting things. So let's give it a shot. So here's a surface. Actually, uh, one word of warning, all of the surfaces I'll show are triangle meshes, but I erase any lines that are flat. So the color of the edges depends on what angle there is b between two adjacent triangles. Okay, so we take this uh, surface of revolution, we run our flow, and it starts to look like what we get what we want. So we get ruling lines, we get something that looks cylindrical. But with this additional interesting phenomenon that, in fact, we don't just get one developable piece. This, this doesn't just turn into, let's say, a piece of a cylinder, but it turns into these two pieces of cones. So why is that? Well, what we can do here is take advantage of this connection that I talked about between the smooth and the, and the discrete setting. You know, this discussion has been fairly discrete up to this point, but we can go back and we can analyze what does our energy mean in the smooth setting. Again, a lot, uh, you know, not going through this step by step, but the most important thing that happens is we realize, ah, actually, in terms of the smooth geometry, what we're minimizing is the square of the smallest principal curvature. So if you remember, uh, our Gaussian curvature was the product of the two principal curvatures. If the smallest one vanishes, then we're in good shape. We have zero Gaussian curvature, so we know it, we're at least flat. Another thing that's, that's very nice about this energy is how it behaves for piecewise developable surfaces. So here we have uh, kind of the, the result we saw before. We, we have two developable pieces meeting along a nice smooth curve. And so what is the, how does the energy behave here? Well, certainly it's zero for each of the cylindrical pieces. And along this curve in the middle, okay, kappa one has some finite value, so you know, kappa one squared is also some non-zero number, but we're integrating that over just the curve. So just a, this tiny little set, set of measures zero. And so overall, 
the energy of the surface is still zero. And so what that means is even fairly interesting surfaces like this kind of developable snowflake, this is also a zero of our energy. And that's really good news because for developable design, those are the objects we're interested in. We're not just interested in finding one developable patch that approximates our surface, but actually breaking up our surface into many different patches. Okay. So here's maybe a more interesting example. We take a bunny and we run our flow and it evolves into these nice patches with nice, uh, both nice rolling lines and some fairly nice smooth uh, feature curves. And again, nothing tricky going on here. No, no meshing, no user interaction, just kind of happening on its own. If we plot the Gaussian curvature of the surface, we see that we're also getting exactly what we wanted, that the curvature starts out distributed all over the surface. So we have positive and negative curvature as uh, red and blue. And this gets concentrated onto these seam curves. And in fact, if we subdivide the mesh and continue to run this optimization process, it concentrates even further. So really, this phenomenon that the energy ignores uh, things that are going on just on curves. Uh, here's some more preliminary results, just taking different surfaces and turning them into developable approximations. And at this point, you might ask, well, OK, so how exactly do these patches get sort of chosen by the energy? How would I control if I don't like this? How would I control it? You know, how would I do things differently? And a really good example to think about is the perfectly round sphere. So this is a surface where if you came to me and said, I would like to make a developable approximation of the sphere, I would say, please give me more information, right? Because uh, clearly there's no one way of doing it. Uh, how do you pick which side the patches are on, basically? And so in the smooth setting, what you imagine is just even a tiny little perturbation of the surface is going to send this flow off in a different direction. In the discrete case, that means that depending on how I choose to mesh the input surface, I'm going to get a different decomposition into patches. So all of these were initially a sphere, but just using a mesh that looked like a tetrahedron or a cube or an icosahedron or whatever. And so this is actually something we can use to our advantage. We can use this to guide uh, the direction of these, these patches by saying, OK, maybe we care about, for instance, principal curvature directions, which is what we've done in this case. So this encourages our flow to flow to something that has these nice uh, sweeping curves along the front and back. Okay, so lots more to come here. This is uh, still a work in progress, but uh, hopefully there will be some nice, more nice results in, and actually getting to fabricate some of these things. Um, right now I'm going to switch to the opposite direction. So, so far I've been talking about this problem of how do you start out with a smooth object and understanding what should it look like in the discrete setting. And this time around, I'm going to go the opposite direction. I have some interesting discrete structure, and I want to understand what it means in terms of smooth geometry. So this is a project uh, with a lot of folks from Mark Pauly's group at EPFL, and also Daniel Piker uh, from Foster and Partners. OK, so so far we've talked a lot about developable materials, hopefully have some intuition at this point about uh, what that means. Uh, but there's another very interesting kind of material for fabrication, and that's oxetic materials. What is that? Oxetic is maybe even less familiar word than developable. So again, we go pick up our dictionary. Uh, and OK, we get this really kind of useless sounding definition, funny sounding definition, having the property of counterintuitively expanding when stretched. So it sounds useless until you actually see what this looks like. And then you think, yeah, that is counterintuitive. Like, that's not how most materials behave. So basically, if you pull on this thing, it uniformly expands in all directions. and pretty much any oxetic material, the way that happens is actually it's nothing funny about the material itself. It's made of very, very standard material, but there's some microstructure that causes this oxetic behavior, this uniformly expanding behavior. So here this is made out of rigid plastic, but you can imagine if you had many, many units of this, it would behave like this foam. Uh, so this is also, you can also say this is a negative Poisson ratio. Uh, the very nice thing is that in, in two dimensions, we can get oxetic behavior by taking a developable sheet, so taking something like sheet metal or plastic or leather, and just cutting a very special pattern into this sheet. So this, is, this particular pattern is called the Kagome lattice, but there are many, many other patterns you could, uh, you could use here. And what this does is it really changes the nature of what you can do with a developable material. So you know, we, we've already talked about how if I just have one developable patch, it has to be pretty simple. It has to have ruling lines everywhere. If I try to approximate a sphere, uh, it's pretty hard. It's a pretty poor approximation of a sphere. But if I 
cut into this material, then all of a sudden, with the same material, the same plastic, I can get much, much better approximations of the geometry. And so then you start to wonder, okay, I have this funny discrete structure, what can it do? What shapes can I make? One way to get intuition about that is by playing with it, but another way is to say, okay, well, what does this mean in terms of the smooth differential geometry? And that's the approach that we've taken. Um, so we are certainly not the first people to <laughs> play around with this kind of material. For many, many years, people have been playing around with oxetic design. Ron Resch was an uh, early, early person doing this with origami. Uh, even Nike now has it in some of their shoes. They're also really interesting ways of fabricating surfaces that behave this way uh, in the lab. So you have maybe electronically actuated uh, oxetic materials, or you have lithographic hydrogels where if you change the temperature, it swells into a different shape. So really cool technology. Again, just like in our piecewise developable case, we, we notice one thing all of these designs have in common, which is that they're all very, very simple geometrically. Right? We have like a hemisphere, we have a you know, flat piece and so forth. And so once again, you know, what, what's great about computational design is we can try to say, okay, let's try to take any input surface, again, any unstructured triangulation, and turn it into some kind of oxetic design. And so that's our, that's our goal. Okay, so the first question you might ask is, all right, but with the sphere it worked out so well to just take that piece of material and wrap it around the sphere, and we got a nice approximation. What, you know, why don't we do that with every other surface we're interested in? Just take some oxetic uh, material, wrap it around the, the object, and we're done. Uh, the truth is, if you try this out, either uh, by hand or computationally, you get some pretty gnarly stuff. It doesn't, doesn't work how you might hope. And so instead, we're going to take a hint from uh, people who have been doing these kind of panelized structures and say, actually, we're going to use insights from differential geometry to choose how we initialize this optimization. So make some smooth observation that tells us basically what should this look like. And the key observation with these oxetic materials is, well, if you play around with them for long enough, you say, huh, these kind of behave like conformal maps. Okay, so what are, what are conformal maps? Conformal maps are those maps where scale can change, but angles are exactly preserved. So here, the size of the squares gets bigger and smaller, but you always have right angles. Okay. Uh, now, just as an aside, uh, for this is the one slide, for, for people who are really interested in this kind of question about conformal maps and discrete conformal maps and so forth, uh, you might be wondering, is there in fact, you know, is, it, is it beyond just an analogy? Is there in fact some exact sense in which this Kagome lattice is conformal? And a couple answers. One answer is, well, we know for sure it doesn't correspond to, uh, at least not in any straightforward way, to any known notion of discrete conformal equivalence. So it doesn't look like circle patterns or cross ratios, and you can, you can construct counterexamples uh, showing that. But one interesting thing that we can show is that in the plane, if we have one of these lattices and we want to know how we're allowed to deform it, we end up with a linear boundary value problem where the degrees of freedom at the boundary are real rather than vector valued. So this really, really strongly s smells of cauchy riemann equations. Okay, so if none of that made sense, uh, no worries, uh, not essential to what we're gonna do in terms of our algorithms. So the basic idea is we're first going to use this idea of conformal mapping to initialize. We compute a conformal map from the plane to our surface. We use that map to guess what this initial uh, lattice pattern is going to be on the surface, and then we optimize, finally, uh, the pattern to really satisfy our physical or design constraints, so to get the final output. And, you know, another thing that's important to ask is, okay, so you made a connection to conformal mapping, why is that useful computationally? I mean, this could be just as hard as the original problem. Well, the answer is actually that's, that's not the case. There's, uh, conformal mapping is, in, in some sense, one of the most successful uh, parts of computational differential geometry. Really efficient algorithms for doing all sorts of things with, with conformal mapping. So anytime you manage to turn your problem into a conformal problem, you should be very, very happy. Um, okay, but there are some additional challenges that show up in this context that don't show up in traditional conformal geometry algorithms. One is that we have bounds on the scaling factor. So just because of the way that this linkage is constructed, you can only open it up by a factor of two and no more. 
On the other hand, with conformal maps, the scale factor can be completely arbitrary. For instance, if I look at the nose of Max Planck here, uh, I notice that there's some extreme scaling around that point. So you start to wonder again, well, what kind of shapes can I actually make? It's nice to know that these look kind of conformal, but maybe I'm very limited in the kind of geometry I can make. Well, here we're saved by a very beautiful idea, again, from, from this conformal uh, computational geometry world of cone singularities. So the idea is if I have a surface that has a lot of curvature, like the, the ears of this cat, and I try to flatten it in the plane, uh, these ears might get mapped to very, very small regions, extreme scaling. So what I can do instead, at least conceptually, is I can say, okay, well, rather than going immediately to the plane, I won't be so greedy. First, I'm going to map to a surface that is flat or really developable almost everywhere, except at a couple of specially chosen cone points. So this is like a, a coffee filter. Once I have this, I have a different way of flattening it out, which is what we talked about with the cone at the very beginning. I can just cut from the boundary to the cone and lay this out flat, and now the area distortion near these cones is much less severe. And if you think about this a little more, you realize actually the answer is we can make any shape we want within a, a scale bound of two as long as we're willing to put in cone singularities. Cone singularities can always mitigate the, the scale distortion. So that's, very, uh, that's a very happy thing for fabrication because the user now doesn't have to worry about, OK, I need to have some special, smooth, really smooth surface. Uh, yet again, there are things that we have to think about that are a bit different from traditional conformal mapping. One is that in order to keep on uh, having a pattern that can open and close, that doesn't get locked, we actually have every vertex has to have even valence because we have to have pairs of triangles that open and close. So this just means we have to quantize our cone angles to be multiples of 2 pi over 3, but something that's easily done. OK, so here's now the current state of the algorithm. We start with some input surface. We compute a conformal map, maybe with cone singularities. We put down our oxetic pattern, maybe our Kagome lattice or some other pattern. And then we push that pattern onto the surface and do the final optimization. OK, so it's not exactly. Uh, what we need, but very close. So the first question is, how do we determine you know, what this pattern should look like on the surface? Rather than filling the, the triangles from our mapping, we say, OK, well, all of these triangles have to have the same size. They're just rigidly rotating and, and uh, moving around. So we can do a simple calculation that says, OK, given the size of the triangle that bounds the triangle in our pattern, what should be its angle of rotation? Just a little calculus. And from there, I'm not going to go into it because it's not particularly, you know, there's from here, nothing particularly deep going on. We simply say, do some nonlinear optimization to satisfy whatever objectives we're interested in. So maybe we want to keep the mesh close to the, the original input surface. Uh, we also want to make sure that we don't have much stretching in our final edges because then we can't fabricate it. And we also want to avoid self-collisions because, again, you can't fabricate something that's passing through itself. Okay. So finally, some examples of things we've really done with this, uh, with this framework. Uh, so here we've taken the same face that we've been looking at and turned it into a, a mask made out of a copper sheet. So this is laser cut copper. The annoying thing is that currently we still have to 3D print the whole mask to figure out how to arrange this thing in space. So this is something we're currently looking at. What are other fabrication technologies that might let us bake this curvature actually into the pattern? Uh, just another example is shoe. So here we take, again, a sheet of aluminum in this case. We find this pattern, we laser cut it, and then a graduate student diligently wraps it around a 3D printed model. Uh, and here's a, just a little more fun view of the surface. And you notice you get the double curvature, especially in the back of the shoe, you have this doubly curved surface which is something traditionally, okay, developable can't be doubly curved. Well, you know, what does that really mean? Developable can be doubly curved if you chop it up into tiny little pieces and view it as a conformal map. So, um, just another example, a dress this time actually made out of leather, which smells awful when you laser cut it, um, but looks beautiful on the screen. Maybe wait a while before you wear it. Uh, and here's the rotating view. And then another example that is actually not fabricated, but a synthetic example that's just kind of, uh, you know, interesting inspiration to think about things you could do with this kind of material 
is that there are lots of different shapes you can make with one flat sheet. In fact, uh, you have this whole kind of uh, conformal homotopy class of shapes that are available to you. So you can make two different masks out of the same sheet, or you could even imagine if you could in some way actuate this material, you could have shapes that kind of morph between two configurations. Here we just do it with, with the magic of computer graphics. Um, yeah, and you can go on and on. Different ideas of what you could do with this, uh, you know, different kinds of dynamic lighting design or design adapted to a particular environment and so forth. Um, kind of looking at this at a, at a high level, uh, you know, we've looked at these two different materials, developable and oxetic. So in terms of differential geometry, developable materials are really about isometric deformations. And in, in the past uh, decades, people have done some really incredible stuff just with isometric deformations, uh, a lot of coming from the perspective of origami. So maybe folding up solar panels to put into space so that they're easier to ship up there, or self-folding uh, robotics, or stents that go into the heart that are folded up and then open up in the, in the heart, or a kayak made out of origami. You can order this online. Um, I know a guy who has one. He hasn't drowned yet. Um, so, so you can do so many amazing things already just with isometric deformations. And now you think about oxetic materials. Well, oxetic materials, as we've just seen, kind of model conformal deformations. And isometric deformations are just a small, small subset of all conformal deformations. So now we have this much larger design space to work with. And on top of that, the computational tools that we need to work in this design space are, as I said, kind of the best thing you could hope for, super efficient uh, numerical algorithms. So I think it's a really uh, nice question about where does this take us, you know, given that we can already do so much with uh, developable materials. Um, going back to the very beginning, we've just taken a look at developable materials from these two very different perspectives, going from continuous to discrete and discrete con from uh, to continuous, and there are obviously a lot of different paths we could take, not just the ones that we studied. So I think that just in general, this perspective of uh, discrete differential geometry is very, very fruitful and uh, often brings you to insights that you wouldn't have if you worked only in the smooth setting or only in the discrete setting. Um, so I'm very happy to uh, be uh, belong to that community and, and doing this fun stuff. Um, so thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much for the talk, which certainly met my expectations. <laughs> um, although we are running a little bit late, I think we have time for a few questions. So uh, are there questions? Helen, could you include curved folds into your flow so that the features you generate are actually <coughs> Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, right now you have uh, developable patches meeting along curves, but nothing to guarantee that that's a curve fold. So it's an excellent question, what kind of constraint you would add. You know, I'm kind of nervous about it adding any constraint where I need to know where the fold is, because right now you don't need to know anything. Uh, but it is, that is a nice question. Right. The final result you got was quite reminiscent of the fold line mm -hmm. they had, and that was not curve fold because they're, they're That's right. doing it. So I think. That's right. Yes, there, there is this, this work. Uh, I might even have it on a slide. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the challenge there is, for instance, you don't have any notion of ruling lines. So if now you want to mill this thing, you don't know where to go. Uh, you have this kind of idea that you're unfolding pairs of triangles. But yeah, it's definitely, definitely related. Any further questions? If not, well, let's postpone more detailed questions about the mathematics for later. Uh, and thank the speaker again.